Hi, boys and girls. I hope you're having a great day. I'm so glad you joined me for chapter four of Pippi in the South Seas. And this chapter is called Pippi Arranges a Question and Answer B. So let's go ahead and dive in and see what happens. The long, wonderful summer holiday suddenly came to an end and Tommy and Danica went back to school. Pippi still considered herself sufficiently well-educated without going to school and announced very decidedly that she had no intention of setting foot in school ever again. She said that she wouldn't go into the school building until the day she couldn't stand not knowing how to spell the word seasick. But since I'm never seasick, I don't have to worry about spelling it in the first place, she said. And if I should happen to be seasick one day, then I'll have other things to think about than knowing how to spell it. Besides, you'll probably never get seasick, said Tommy. And he was right. Pippi had sailed far and wide with her father before he became the king of a South Sea island and before Pippi had settled down to live in Villa Vilcula. But in all her life, she had never been seasick. Sometimes Pippi would ride over and pick Tommy and Danica up when school was over. This pleased Tommy and Danica very much. They loved to ride the horse, and there certainly weren't very many children who were able to ride home from school on horseback. Please, Pippi, come and pick us up this afternoon, said Tommy one day, just as he and Anika were going to dash back to school after their lunch hour. Yes, please, said Anika, because today is the day that Miss Rosenbloom is going to give out gifts to children who have been very good and worked hard. Mrs. Rose, Miss Rosenbloom was a rich old lady who lived in the little town. She took good care of her money, but once every term she came to school and distributed gifts to the children. But not to all the children, oh no, only to the very good and hard-working children. They were the only ones that got presents. To make sure she would know which children were really good and hardworking, Miss Rosenbloom held long examinations before she distributed the presents. That was the reason all the children in town lived in constant dread of her. Every day when they were about to do their homework and were trying to think of something more amusing to do before getting started, their mother or father would say, Remember Miss Rosenbloom? It was a terrible disgrace to come home to one's parents and brothers and sisters the day Miss Rosenbloom had been to school, and not to have a small coin or bag of candy or at least some underwear to show for it. Yes, of all things, underwear. Miss Rosenbloom distributed underwear to the poorest children, and it didn't matter how poor a child was if he didn't know what the answer was when Miss Rosenbloom asked how many inches there were in a mile. It wasn't surprising at all that the children were afraid of Miss Rosenbloom. They lived in terror of her soup as well. Believe it or not, Miss Rosenbloom had all the children weighed and measured in order to see if there were any among them who were especially thin and pathetic and who looked like they weren't getting enough to eat at home. All those who were found to be poor and too skinny had to go to Miss Rosenbloom's every lunch hour and eat a big plate of soup. It would have been fine if there hadn't been a whole lot of nasty barley in the soup. It always felt so slippery in the mouth. Now the big day had arrived when Miss Rosenbloom was coming to the school. Classes stopped earlier than usual and all the children gathered in the schoolyard. Miss Rosenbloom sat at a big table that had been placed in the middle of the schoolyard. To help her, she had two assistants who wrote down everything about the children. Phew, excuse me. How much they weighed and if they were able to answer her questions, and if they were poor and needed clothes, and if they had good marks in conduct, and if they had younger brothers and sisters at home who also needed clothing. There was no end to the things that Miss Rosenbloom wanted to know. A box containing coins stood on the table in front of her. There was also a lot of bags of candy and big piles of undershirts and socks and woolen pants. All children get in line, shouted Miss Rosenbloom. In the first line, I want children who don't have any brothers or sisters at home. In the second line, children who only have one or two brothers and sisters. 
and in the third, children who have more than two brothers and sisters. This arrangement was made because Miss Rosenblum wanted everything to be orderly. Besides, it was only fair that the children who had many brothers and sisters at home should get bigger bags of candy than those who didn't have any. Then the examination began. Oh, how the children trembled. The ones who couldn't answer the minute a question was asked to go and stand in a corner, and then they were sent home without as much as one piece of candy for their little brothers and sisters. Both Tommy and Anika were very good at their schoolwork, but in spite of that, the, blow in Anika, the bow in Anika's hair quivered with suspense as she stood in line beside Tommy, and Tommy's face got wider and wider the closer he got to Miss Rosenblum. When it was his turn to answer, there was a sudden commotion in line for children waiting without brothers and sisters. Someone was pushing her way forward through the crowd. And who should it be but Pippi? She brushed the children aside and went straight up to Miss Rosenblum. Excuse me, but I wasn't here when you started, she said. In which line should I stand since I don't have 14 brothers and sisters? of which 13 are naughty little boys. Miss Rosenblum looked very disapproving. You can stay where you are for the present, she said. But it seems to me that quite soon you will be moved over into the line of children who are going to stand in the corner. Then the assistants wrote down Pippi's name and she was weighed in order to find out whether she needed soup. But she weighed five pounds too much for that. You don't get any soup said Miss Rosenblum. Sometimes luck is with me, said Pippi. Now all I have to do is get by without getting stuck with the underwear. Then I'll be able to breathe more freely. Miss Rosenblum paid no attention to her. She was looking through the dictionary for a difficult word for Pippi to spell. Now then, she said finally, will you tell me how to spell seasick? I'd be glad to, said Pippi. S E-E-S-I-K. Miss Rosenblum smiled, a sour smile. Is that so, she said. The dictionary spells it differently. Then it was very lucky that you wanted to know how I spell it, said Pippi. S-E-E-S-I-K is the way that I have always spelled it, and it seems to have worked out just fine. Make note of that, said Mrs. Rosen, Miss Rosenblum to the assistants, and grimly pressed her lips together. Yes, do that, said Pippi. Make a note of this fine spelling, and see to it that the change is made in the dictionary as soon as possible. I wonder if you can answer this one said Miss Rosenblum. When did King Carl the Twelfth die? Oh dear, is he dead too? cried Pippi. It's awful how many people die these days. If he had kept his feet dry, I'm sure that never would have happened. Make note of that, said Miss Rosenblum to her assistants in an icy voice. Yes, by all means, do that, said Pippi, and make a note that it's very good to keep leeches next to the skin, and if you should drink a little warm kerosene before going to bed, it will be very invigorating. This picture. Miss Rosenblum looked desperate. Why does a horse have molars with dark markings running through them? She said in a stern voice. Are you sure that he has? Said Pippi thoughtfully. You can ask him yourself. He's standing over there, she said, and pointed to her horse, who was tied to a tree. She laughed contentedly. <laughs> it's a good thing I brought him along, she said. Otherwise, you would never know why he has molars with markings in them. Because honestly, I have no idea. And what's more, I don't care very much either. A narrow line was now all that was left of Miss Rosenblum's mouth. 
This is unbelievable, she murmured. Absolutely unbelievable. Yes, I think so too, said Pippi, pleased. If I continue being this clever, I probably won't be able to avoid getting a pair of pink woolen underwear. Make a note of that, said Mrs. Rosen, Miss Rosenbloom to the assistants. No, don't bother, said Pippi. I really don't care so much about pink woolen underwear. That wasn't what I meant. But if you could make a note saying that I'm going to have a big bag of candy. I am going to ask you one more question, said Miss Rosenbloom. Her voice sounded as if she were strangling. Yes, keep right on, said Pippi. I like this kind of question and answer game. Can you answer this one, said Miss Rosenbloom. Peter and Paul are going to divide a cake. If Peter gets one-fourth, what does Paul get? A stomach ache, said Pippi. She turned to the assistants. Make a note of this, she said seriously. Make a note that Paul gets a stomach ache. But Miss Rosenbloom was finished with Pippi. You are the most ridiculous and disagreeable child I have ever seen, she said. Go over there and stand in the corner. Pippi obediently trotted off, muttering angrily to herself. It's unfair. I answer every single question. When she walked a few steps, she suddenly thought of something and quickly elbowed her way back to Miss Rosenbloom. Excuse me, she said, but I forgot to give my chest measurement and my height above sea level. Make a note of that, she said to the assistants. Not that I want any soup, far from it, but the books should be in order after all. If you don't go over there and stand in the corner immediately, said Miss Rosenbloom, I know a little girl who is going to get a sound spanking. Aw, poor child, said Pippi. Where is she? Send her to me and I'll defend her. Make a note of that. Then Pippi went over and stood in the corner with the other children who couldn't answer questions. There, the atmosphere was far from happy. Many of the children were sobbing and crying at the thought that their parents and their brothers and their sisters, oh, what would they say when they came home without the least little coin and without any candy? Pippi looked around at the crying children and swallowed hard several times. Then she said, we'll have a question and answer be of our own. The children looked a bit more cheerful, but they didn't quite understand what Pippi meant. Form two lines, said Pippi. All of you who know that King Carl the Twelfth is dead, stand in one line, and those who haven't heard that he is dead, stand in the other. But since all the children knew that King Carl the Twelfth was dead, there was only one line. This is no good, said Pippi. You have to have at least two lines, otherwise it isn't right. Ask Miss Rosenbloom, and you'll see. She stopped to think. I have it, she said at last. All very clever and well-trained pranksters will form one line. And who is to stand in the other line? Asked a little girl who didn't want to be thought of a prankster. In the other line, we'll have all of those who are not quite so clever as to play pranks, said Pippi. Over at Miss Rosenbloom's table, the questioning continued full force, and now and again, a child on the verge of tears came shuffling over to Pippi's crowd. And now comes the hard part. Now we're going to see if you have been doing your homework, she turned to a skinny little boy in a blue shirt. You over there, she said. Give me the name of someone who is dead. The boy looked a little surprised. And then he said, well, old Miss Peterson in number 57. 
What do you know? said Pippi. Do you know anyone else? No, the boy didn't. Then Pippi put her hands in front of her mouth in the form of a megaphone and in a stage voice whisper, King Carl, the Twelfth of Cars. Then Pippi asked all the children in turn if they knew anyone who was dead. And they all answered, Old Miss Peterson in number 57. And King Carl XII. This examination is going better than I expected, said Pippi. Now I'm going to ask one more thing. If Peter and Paul are going to divide a cake, and Peter absolutely doesn't want any, but sits himself down in a corner and gnaws on a dry little bit of bread, who is then forced to sacrifice himself and eat the whole cake? Paul! shouted all the children. I wonder if children as clever as you could be found anywhere else, said Pippi. But you shall have a reward. From her pockets, she dug out a whole handful of gold coins, and each child got one. Each child also got a huge bag of candy, which Pippi took out of her rucksack. That is why there was great rejoicing among the children who were supposedly in disgrace. And, was, and when Miss Rosenbloom's examination was finished and everybody was going home, the children who had been standing in the corner were the quickest to disappear. But first they all crowded around Pippi. Thank you, dearest Pippi, they cried. Thank you for the coins and the candy. Oh, it's nothing, said Pippi. You don't need to thank me, but you must never forget that I rescued you, I rescued you all from pink woolen underwear. And that is the end of our chapter. Make sure you join us tomorrow for chapter five, which is called Pippi Gets a Letter. Bye!